Welcome everyone to the second Uncharted Waters Navigating Uncertainty webinar. Uh, like last week's conversation with Lauren Alexandra, this webinar is geared for students and recent grads who are dealing with turbulence, uncertainty, and ambiguity uh, in a job market that looks like anything and that looks unlike anything they might have been expecting. Um, I'm Vivian Corwin. I'm a faculty member here at the Gustafson School of Business. Um, and today I'm happy to be speaking with Felipe Civita. Uh, Felipe is a graduate of our Masters of Global Business program here at Gustafson and the International Projects Manager with Norquest College. Felipe is passionate about social entrepreneurship, education and sustainability and was selected as one of the Alberta Councils for Global Co Cooperation's Top 30 Under 30 in 2018. Uh, just a quick note that we are recording this webinar. Uh, the chat feature has not been enabled for the webinar, uh, but we will be taking questions. So please do use the question and answer function to post your questions as they occur to you. Uh, if somebody else posts a question that you'd like to see addressed, make sure that you vote for it so that we have a sense of what your pressing, pressing issues are. Okay, uh, Felipe and I will talk for just a little bit up front and then we will turn to your questions. Thanks very much for joining me, Felipe. Um, can to start with, can you elaborate a little bit more about what you do now and how it is that you got there? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for thanks again for the opportunity to be speaking to a lot of you today. It's a pleasure to always be engaged with you, Vic. I had a, a wonderful time as a student, and I'm I'm a proud alumni, and I rock my UVic alumni travel tag. <laughs> uh, at that time, where we were allowed to travel, that seemed that was a long time ago. Um, a little bit about how I got where I am now. So I grew up in Brazil. I came to Canada as an international student back in 2000, 2010, actually. And I, I, I was 17 at that time. I, I, I couldn't quite speak English that well. Uh, I was able to go through a, an intensive English program and then get my undergraduate degree at the University of Lethbridge in, in Southern Alberta. For those of you who are familiar with Alberta, uh, you know where that is. If you're not, it's about two hours south of, of Calgary, one of the windiest places on earth, I would say. Um, from, from my undergraduate degree, which was a Bachelor of Management in International Management, I was able to, to travel to, to different countries uh, through internships and exchange programs. I had the chance to spend some time in South Korea, work for Petronas in Malaysia, and also spent some time studying Eastern European finance in, in Hungary, which was a very, uh, very good experience. From, from that time after I graduated, I was able to, to get a job as a project management trainee for ACOM, which is, if you are not familiar with ACOM, it's one of the world's largest construction company. And I was working on their oil and gas division in Northern Alberta. I was actually based out of Edmonton, but worked in a lot of projects up uh, in some of the more remote Northern communities in Northern Alberta. I went for the first phase of, of their program. And that's where, that was around the time in 2015 where prices of oil, as you remember, started crashing. And I, I really didn't want my career to be attached to such a volatile industry. Um, that was kind of my rationale at that point. So I was trying to look at different opportunities and, and different doors that would potentially open. And I came across education at that time, which, uh, which is something I'm, I'm in, uh, in you know, until now. And it's something that I plan on continuing from, from that Opportunity in oil and gas. I started working um, in project management uh, at Bow Valley College in Calgary. I moved to, to Calgary from from Edmonton, and I had I had the wonderful opportunity of of working on a team that was really building something new, which was the college expansion into East Africa and the Caribbean. So we were we were able to 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 work on projects uh, around the world, but most most focused in in Tanzania, Kenya, that East African corridor and also some very exciting opportunities in the Caribbean, St. Kitts, Grenada, Barbados. So there was a, a very exciting time in my life. Uh, I was traveling a lot and uh, able to, to work with just a fantastic team. From after I, I, I did my, my a few years of, of, that, uh, of that work, I decided I wanted to pursue a master's degree and the MGB, the Master of Business Program, UVic just became a, an easy choice. It was an obvious choice for me. It was my first, and only, I think, pick at that time. I bet all my, I bet all my coins into one place, and I'm glad that worked out. Uh, so I, I went through the through the MGB program. I had the chance to study at Victoria, of course, and then Netherlands and Peru. My final internship on that program was actually a, an actual working contract uh, with a fintech slash impact investment firm in in Peru. 
So I got to spend some time in Lima working on a very interesting educational solution focused on, on financing education for, for, uh, for vulnerable youth and, and people that don't have access to, to formal financing. So that was, that was quite, uh, quite an interesting, interesting, um, interesting time. Uh, something else uh, that after that happened, well, sorry, after that happened, I, um, I returned to Canada and I started working for Quantum Polytechnic in Vancouver. I had a chance to actually uh, be engaged more on the student side of things. So working as their global engagement manager, managing some of their, their contracts and projects um, overseas. So it was quite interesting. And then uh, when my contract was coming to an end, I joined um, Northwest College here in Edmonton and was able to, uh, to, to now be more engaged on the project side. So now I'm, I'm more of a, a project manager as opposed to uh, working on, on students. So I mostly manage now contracts and, and, and consulting initiatives overseas, uh, very similar to the work I used to do at Bow Valley, but more focused on um, our revenue generating contracts now. So that, that's a little bit about, about what I do, what, you know, how I've got to this place. Uh, but it's been, it's been a journey of, of over 10 years now since I moved to Canada. And, you know, as a former international student, you know, a lot of hiccups, lots of setbacks. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the, the overall theme has been always threading forward. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, you may think that you got to always take steps forward. But I think I've taken a lot of steps back to move two steps forward. You know, you move one back to move two forward kind of thing. So that's a little bit about my experience and how, and how I got here. Excellent. Thank you. It's a fascinating history you've got. It's quite varied, uh, just industry-wise, geography-wise. You've had, you've had quite a mix of experiences. Um, so I'm glad we have this opportunity to talk today. Um, we'll get to some specific advice you might have for students and what you see as essential skills for them in this new environment in just a little bit. Um, but first, I'm hoping we can talk about some of the changes we may be seeing in organizations um, as a result of this pandemic. So you and I have already talked about the ways in the past. Um, we've talked a little bit about the ways in which this crisis and the rapid, and the rapid change that it requires of organizations has challenged traditional corporate hierarchies um, and actually may be opening up opportunities for people to demonstrate expertise and make contributions that may not be consistent with their position on the organizational chart. Um, and this actually might be an exciting time for, for people lower down in the organization to enter mm -hmm. because there is, there is an opportunity here that may not have been there in the past. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? Yeah, absolutely. I think every change that comes through how that, that challenges this status quo, I think provides opportunities for people across the board. I think now that organizations may, you know, leaders in organizations may just not have the answers to all the challenges they're facing they're going to be looking across the institution for input. And I think having a more proactive approach to this may benefit those that are perhaps not at that decision making level. Um, I know that in, in the college sector, at least in, in the education sector, there's been a lot of town halls lately. There's been a lot of opportunities for people to engage uh, with senior leaders or their managers at a more informal setting. Uh, something that wasn't there in the past. Now everyone is at home. Everyone is kind of a, a, a level, like, a, a, like the field has been leveled, I think, in a way that everyone is at home. Everyone is facing similar issues. So it allows people that, that weren't necessarily in those conversations before to be moved back into, into the room. Um, I don't know if I got that one right. That was a bit yeah. of a a uh, hard question. <laughs> it wasn't it? Wasn't a right wrong? Um, and yes, I think I think uh, what you said sort of certainly is is bang on. That. Um, um, yeah, uh, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. But I think also the, the 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 overall shift that I've seen here is this idea of time based to value based. So I think again, I'm not talking about all jobs because there are jobs that you are strictly being measured by how much time you spend. It's it's mm -hmm. it's time and productivity. They're equally combined. But I think a lot of jobs and I think a lot of jobs that graduates that are listening to this that are about to graduate are going to be taking, you don't necessarily have to sit in a desk eight hours a day. That that's not how your work is being valued, right? Mm -hmm. Perhaps before the COVID crisis uh, you would be find yourself sitting in a, in, a, in a desk at work for eight hours and you'd actually maybe for the last two hours of your day, there wouldn't be much to do and you just wish you could leave to do something else because you're being measured on that time you actually spend. 
And I'm finding that now it's this idea of creating value. So if you're actually working two hours a day, but you're creating value, then you, you don't actually have to be eight hours sitting down um, if you're not creating value for that, right? So I think we might see a shift of, instead of you being measured only by how much time you actually spend, is mm -hmm. how much value you actually bring to the organization. So even with my working schedule now, I'm finding that before, I was before the before the, the, the pandemic happened, it kind of changed how we do things. I was on that schedule that you know, although we had a very we have a very flexible team, very flexible hours, I still found myself find found myself sitting, you know, not twingling my thumbs. I was always being busy, but there were peaks, you know, and, and mm -hmm. there were days that well, you know, I could leave a little earlier today. Um, you know, I just I'm just not as busy, right? Uh, but now at home, at least now I manage my time much better. I'm working a little more, but I'm, I'm working more focused that, you know, I, I have more time to do other things because I, I've just allocated my time to the actual value creation, not mm -hmm. to, I, I don't, I'm not in front of my computer because I have to be in front of my computer. I'm in front of my computer because I'm actually doing something. If I mm -hmm. don't have to do something, I'm, I'm not in front of my computer. Mm -hmm. But again, see. that's easier in some jobs, some jobs that, that's virtually impossible. Some, you know, some, some of the lucky ones are able to do that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so students and new grads are understandably nervous about looking for jobs in today's environments. Um, you've spoken about the importance of students and new grads managing their expectations and being open minded to new options and new opportunities. Can you elaborate on what you mean by this and what sort of advice you'd give to students and new grads now? Sure. You know, I think it's normal to feel nervous. And I think, you know, if you look at the news, you, it, it's, it's really hard to find some positive. I think, you know, if you're a new grad and you just go, I, I tried it today before this, I just go new grad COVID-19 and everything that pops up is negative. And the reality is it's, it would be naive for me to sugarcoat it. And, and the reason is it's not going to be easy, but it's not, I think the, there's always hope at the end because this is a temporary and B experience is experience, right? I think if you had this idea of getting your dream job, after you graduated, that, that dream job may be there or it may not be there at this point. And, and the thing is, if you were to get a different role that is not your dream job, experience is experience. And, you know, getting paid to pay your bills is, is getting paid. And, and I, I don't quite like to say this, but, you know, it's important for you to get through the door, even though it's a door, I didn't even know it existed. I think that's the biggest thing is that if I'm being fully honest, before in my last year of my undergrad, if you had told me I would be building a career in international education, I would probably be like, get out of here. Like, I, 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 you know, no way. I want to be in oil and gas. That's, that's what I've studied. That's what I want to do. Um, but here I am. You know, I knocked on a door. I didn't even know it existed. And I couldn't be happier. You know, I found my niche. I found what I wanted to do. Um, and, and you just never know, right? So I think keeping an open mind. If you studied accounting, if you studied finance, and you're really keen on getting into finance, really keen to get into accounting, maybe, you know, try to look for, for different industries that it might be able to apply some of those concepts in. So um, I think just keeping a very open mind and, and, and be easy on yourself. I think that's also another big factor is that careers are not marathons, you know, sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> careers are marathons. They're not hundred meter sprints. So if you look at, let's say you're 23, 24 and you're graduating, you're looking at a, a solid potentially 40 year career. So if you're looking at a one year or two year setback, remember taking a step back, stick to forward of working on a job that you weren't necessarily too keen on, that's a very small percentage of your overall career. So really try to think about this as a marathon and maybe taking one step back will mean that you can take two steps forward, you know, two years from now when, when that job that you wanted to get finally opens up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the next thing is not focusing on, on comparison. Because at the end of the day, in a class of 40 people that are graduating with you, let's say your immediate circle are 40 people, there will be people that will get their dream jobs, undoubtedly. There will be people within your circle that will just, it just seems like their life is just much better, their careers are just much faster. But again, don't obsess over others' accomplishments and comparison. Everyone has their own path. And I, I have so many examples of, of friends of mine that have they were what got that dream position with that, you know, the big four companies that we all know who they are. Uh, and now, you know, and, and at that time I thought, well, you know, I wish I was, I wish I was in that spot. And, but 
that's not how it works, right? You torture yourself for, for, for something that you, you, just, you just can't control. Uh, mm-hmm. You can't control what jobs your friends will get. And if they get, you know, something better, better than you, at, you know, as you perceive at, at this stage in their career, that doesn't mean they're ahead. Uh, it just means that they got a job and you should be happy for them. Uh, so don't, don't, don't stress over others and don't be, don't be hard on yourself. You know, it's a tough time out there and, and you know, we, things are out of our control and, and accepting that is, is a big part of, of moving forward in my opinion. Mm-hmm. That'll be my, that'll be my, my advice. Experience the experience, be easy on yourself and don't obsess over your immediate circle of colleagues that will undoubtedly get jobs as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so you've had a genuinely global career, obviously, with lots of travel and work across a variety of different cultures. A lot of the students who come to Gustafson come here because they're attracted to our focus on developing a global perspective. Um, many of our recent grads or our current students are struggling with how to think about getting international experience and developing cross-cultural skills at a time when opportunities for travel are by necessity so limited. Um, At the same time, global businesses themselves are struggling to keep their teams connected across time zones and continents. What are your thoughts on the kinds of skills that businesses will need going forward in terms of managing a global, globally distributed cross-cultural workforce? Um, And the, without, with with potentially fewer opportunities for face-to-face interaction. And then what are the implications for the kind of skills that students should think about developing now so that they can be helpful to those organizations? Sure. Absolutely. You know, I think global teams, managing global teams, we had a very interesting exercise in our MGB specifically about this. And I think if global teams were normal, I think they're going to be much, much more common now. I think if you, if you look at how, you know, the, the process of, of work from anywhere, the, the first step is, is work from home. The second step is work from anywhere. And the third step is hire from anywhere, which will virtually change everything. So, being able to actually interact and be able to build a report with people is spread around the world is, is crucial for, for your experience, not only as a team member, but as a manager. I think the first skill that I think not a lot of people seem to be talking about that will be needed in, in this global future, you know, the, how, you know, the, the future of, of global teams is, is technical and digital literacy. So technical skills and digital literacy skills. Although many of us that are millennials and young, we think that we dominate digital and technical skills, that's now, today. Two years, three years, four, five years from now, if we're not keeping up with tendencies, if we're not keeping up with new software, new, you know, new, just new patterns that are, that are evolving, we, uh, we're going to be left behind. So I think that the biggest skill that I could think now is making sure that we're comfortable using technology. And if we need to brush up technology skills or need to provide coaching to other people in how to use technology, I think that's crucial. Service related skills, I also think is, is quite important. Relating to other people is hard mm-hmm. in person. Relating to other people virtually is really, really hard. Mm-hmm. So that's something that I'm currently working on. I think that's what a lot of people should be focusing on is this ability to relate to others even though you may never see that person in face to face in your life. And, and, that, and, and that's happened to me in some projects I've worked on is that you, you're only seeing that person for a video and they're only seeing you for video. How do you make sure you relate to them? How do you be trust? How do you build report? I think that's very, very important. So it's this idea of service related skills. I think the third skill, I think to really be able to manage a global team effectively is the ability to coach, the ability to instruct, and the ability to guide via distance. Again, you're not seeing that person. Water cooler chats are not a thing anymore. No one wants to be grabbing coffee over Skype all the time. That you know, th- those things just don't. They're they're so superficial. It's finding actual and meaningful ways to coach, to instruct, and to guide people into a specific vision that you have for your team or for your for your goal for a specific project, and providing that guide via distance. If you do feel that someone is is struggling with uh, with their, with, with, with what they're trying to do. Um, so those would be my, my three, my three advices. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, I've got a few more questions, but maybe I'll throw it open to, to a question from a student right now. Ekaterina is wondering what are the opportunities that might appear after the pandemic? Do you think, and what sort of skills will be required? Well, I think honestly, a big opportunity that might appear after the pandemic is, is crisis management. 
I think that's a that's an area that I here in Alberta we had quite uh, we I'm, I'm sure if you were in Canada at that time you know that we had the Fort McMurray fires in 20, 2016 if I'm not mistaken and that created a sort of an urgency around uh, for both companies uh, public and private companies to create emergency preparedness programs uh, I don't know if that was the case across the country I know from an experience that a few of my colleagues in some you know medium sized organizations. Uh, when they were ordered to close, they they had they had they, don't, they didn't know what to do. They didn't have a protocol. They didn't have uh, policies or guidelines in place that would guide them through staying closed, physically closed, but still operating as a business from home. Uh, an emergency preparedness plan does that. So I think looking at potential graduate degrees or or, or further schooling or or guidance around being an emergency responder, but from a, a, a business side, not healthcare, because that's, I think that's obvious that's going to be a demanded opportunity in the future, demanded career in the future. But the idea of being able to to guide companies, even as some sort of consultant in emergency preparedness, I think that that would be a highly demanded career because a lot of companies realize that it doesn't take much for the entire business to be disrupted in ways that they've never imagined. Mm -hmm. On March 16th, where the pandemic was declared, a week prior to that, I was watching a hockey game at the Oilers Arena here with 40,000 people. Three weeks before that, I was having lunch with Prime Minister Trudeau in Ethiopia. So it doesn't take much for the, you know, an entire business to be disrupted. It can happen very quickly. So my point here is, if you're curious about emergency response management, there are, I think, I think this would be a career that would be in, in, in high, highly demand. And I think every organization will look for having, if not one person, a team of experts doing that kind of, uh, doing that kind of work within an organization. Wait, and, and your job is, I guess, it's waiting for the worst to happen and mm -hmm. positions that you, you never wish to, to activate, I guess. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. I think you're, I think you're right. I think it's a fascinating area and fascinating opportunity within an organization. Yeah. And, and healthcare as well. I think, I think healthcare as well. And if, again, when people think about healthcare, they immediately go and think about doctors and they think about nurses and healthcare aides, which I think those positions will be more necessary than ever. However, if you're in a BCon grad or you're doing an MBA, you, you may not, want to make the case to become a doctor or a nurse, nor that's really easy to do. It, it, those are very complicated, high skilled jobs that requires further training. However, there are other opportunities within healthcare that could be interesting, I think, for, for business students and for, for engineers, uh, procurement, uh, you know, administration, project management, uh, resource allocation. I think all, uh, you know, I think management skills could be definitely used in a healthcare setting without you actually being a doctor or a nurse uh, or someone working directly with patients. Um, I was just reading the other day about how the whole procurement of, of, of medical equipment has been happening across the country and how, um, you know, hospital administrators have to be so stretched out in terms of, of how they procure things. And, and that workforce is just so limited now that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, federal government had to step up. So I no doubt think that there will be a lot more opportunities and, and maybe new programs too, you know, for, for those wanting to get into public administration specifically around uh, healthcare, which also includes policy management, um, uh, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Um, what strikes me in listening to you talk about both these potential sort of career opening opportunities, but also the changes we talked about earlier that are happening in organizations as they get less hierarchical. Um, is sort of these transversal skills, skills that aren't associated with any particular function. It's not a depth of knowledge in say accounting or operations management. It's, it's a broader set of skills, which the World Economic Forum has actually been calling for for uh, a while now. They've been predicting the most useful skills going forward will be things like complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, cognitive flexibility, uh, service orientation, all of the stuff um, that you've been alluding to or touched on directly. 
Um, and I, I think students sometimes underestimate the extent to which they're developing those skills at the same time as they're developing subject matter expertise throughout the course of their programs. So I'm going off script from what you and I have, have prepared for today, but I'm just curious if you can think about um, your, your point of reference, for example, would be the MGB program. If we think about those kinds of transversal skills, um, how do they get developed over the course of a program like that? And how would you articulate them to an employer who may not understand the extent to which you've built those skills through what yeah. you look like a program? A good example that I use all the time, uh, and maybe I'll just provide like, maybe a personal example about how I've, I've used the MGV experience to own a skill that is not a technical skill, is this idea of resiliency and adaptability. Mm -hmm. I think everyone in life has gone for change. I think that's undoubted. Some people have gone through more extreme changes like moving a country, moving a city. Some people have gone through, you know, other types of changes like changing a program. But your ability to actually frame that in a way that allows the employer to see how resilient and adaptive you, you are is huge. So for me, the MGB program, what I, what I tend to do is I, I look at the program and say, okay, well, the program actually requires me to go from country A to country B to country C. I have to adapt not only to finding new housing, you know, where to go, but also I have to adapt to a brand new education system, which I think if I have any MGB in line now, they will know that moving from Canadian to European Dutch, then moving to Peruvian is, is mm -hmm. huge. It's, it's such a large shift. It's like Canada and Peru are the complete opposite of the spectrum. And then you have the European style, just completely different than anything else too. So if you're able to take those experiences out of that and out of the, the classes that you take and just focusing on that particular skill of explaining, okay, I went through this three different program, I, this three different, I guess, three different countries within the same program. I not only adapted, I succeeded it. I, you know, here are my outcomes. You know, I went through all these changes, but I was able to achieve grade A, grade B, you know, I was able to do all these things, run through this consulting project, write a thesis, you know, make all these connections around the world. At the same time, adapting to all these changes along the way that were just thrown at me on purpose, I'm assuming, I'm not mm -hmm. assuming but I know they're on purpose now. Um, you know, and, and navigating these very complex scenarios really allowed, uh, re really allowed me to, to take that away. And then every time I'm in an interview and they ask, you know, have you ever dealt with change or, and that's the first thing I bring up is like, you know, my adaptability and resiliency skills are, are just, so much better now because of, of a program that I did that I went through this, this, and this. Uh, so that, that's just an example. Uh, but I think, you know, I think for, for students that uh, like digital literacy, for example, I think if you're able to explain in an interview, if you're ever asked, you know, how are your digital skills? You can say, you know, I've taken an entire semester of online courses and I not only took it, but I succeeded <laughs> at it. Here are my grades. Here were some of the challenges that I went through, but here's how I succeeded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Good, and I think students now listening can add to that things like, um, you know, I know a lot of our students have, have a lot of experience in working with face-to-face -face teams, creating new face-to-face -face teams. Now to have that, we can add remote teams, right? We can add exactly. engagement with people that they've not met before. And yeah. to see all of this experience is, is opportunity. Good, okay. Um, Switching gears a bit, I'm going to ask one more question and then, and then uh, students do chime in uh, or listeners, if you've got, you don't have to be a student to chime in with a question, but if you have any, we've just got a few minutes left for Felipe, so it would be great to get to your questions as well. Um, so I'm just wondering, switching gears a bit, I'm curious about your thoughts about how different organizations have reacted to the pandemic and particularly to managing a remote workforce. And you talked earlier about this switch from measuring time to measuring value and contribution. Some organizations have done this really well. Others have swung the other way and have actually stepped up employee surveillance and doubled down on productivity measures. Um, and as I said, other organizations have been very different. Uh, their responses have focused on the health and well-being of their employees or pivoting to serve sort of uh, community needs, uh, demonstrating unimagined flexibility and in, in switching products or services entirely in response to the pandemic. So I think this is all data for students who are looking for jobs. And I'm curious about what advice you'd give to students and grads about how to discover about uh, how they can discover a lot about a company's culture during events like this. Well, I think that, you know, perhaps finding a company's culture virtually is, is, is quite is quite difficult. And I think when you're, when you're interviewing, 
you want to do as much research as possible about the company. And I would maybe throw the question back to students and say, you know, how do you normally go about finding a, a company's culture when you're just interviewing? Well, the first thing you do is you go in the website, you take a look at what they're doing and in terms of what their vision are, their values. But I think I would really try to get as much information as possible during that contact that you have via interview. Um, small things like being on time, you know, if, if your interviewer is not on time, uh, looking at how, how, how they manage the meeting, um, just looking at small clues and if they respect your time, looking at smaller clues about how they actually manage uh, that via distance interaction. Um, and, and ask. I think that the biggest thing is, is ask. I think one thing I've learned over the years in interviewing is that a lot of the times uh, people don't, don't seem to ask questions during interview, uh, rather because they're, they're too afraid of asking difficult questions or um, they just don't, they, they don't, they, they don't, they just don't, don't do that. It's just not, not common practice. But I think advice I would give is, is be mindful of, of red flags, even if they're small during the entire interview process. But, and also ask questions. I think a company that is, that respects your time before you were employed by them is a company you want to work for. I think a company that doesn't respect your time uh, before you even start working with them, just imagine how they treat you once they hire you. So be mindful of that and, 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 and watch for those smaller red flags. Great. Thank you. Okay. A uh, few more questions here now. Um, uh, Ekaterina is saying you have really impressive work experience and she's wondering if you could uh, share some hints that you used while looking for a job and in particular things like how to be engaged in different communities related to your sphere of activity. Sure. You know, uh, what was the name of the, whoever asked the question? Ekaterina. Ekaterina. Yeah, Ekaterina. You know, I think for me, there were, I think, three things that have really helped me in, in furthering my career. The first thing is, is staying informed. Information is free. That's essentially it. Like you can learn anything on the internet, of course, not to an expert level, but you can find so much information about a company, about a specific project they're working on and a specific market they're in. So really staying informed. If you're really into that company, you're really, you know, into that, that job, you know, opportunity, you stay informed as much as you can build a case, just look as much as possible, wherever that specific lead uh, take you without getting too broad. Just if, if you're given a lead for a job, let's say it's a, it's a job interview, it's a job you're applied to try to find everything you possibly can about that company, about that market. And something that I've done in the past that I've, I've given this tip to a few people and they've used it is actually creating a case. I've done this in every job that I've interviewed for. And I think I've, I've had a pretty good success rate is if you actually take the job opportunity, take the job and you say, okay, this is the job is, I don't know, market research to enter the Lebanese market. Let's say you're working for uh, a foods company. Let's say you're selling um, beef and you, your company is selling beef and they want to explain to the Lebanese market. That is the job. Like that's, you know, essentially the job, the job interview will be around that. That's the position. What you could do is that you could actually create a deck, a presentation with the information available online. You create a three page little PowerPoint presentation. And then you say, these are, this is the opportunity in that particular market. These would be the strategies I would focus in. In the first six months of my job, I would focus on A, B, and C. I would focus on this, this, and this. The results of my first six months will be this, this, and this. Here it is. At the end of the interview, they'll say, hey, Katarina, do you have any questions for us? I'll say, oh, well, you ask a few questions. Say, do you have anything else to add? You say, well, yes, I do. You know, given the time that you've given me to prepare for this interview, I've prepared mm -hmm. a, a three-page deck uh, focused on, on, on some strategies that, that, that your company could do to, uh, to engage in that market. And you end the interview with an actual tangible thing that you've created. And again, this doesn't have to be correct because they're not paying you yet. So it's okay to be wrong. <laughs> You're just creating much more value to, to their time because now everyone else in that interview process has given words. You've given words plus an actual document that just shows initiative. And again, it's fully okay for that document to not have 100% accurate information because you're not going to have access to the internal document. So there's no way for you to know a lot of the internal capabilities. But what you do know, you can add in that document. So mm -hmm. that type of documentation, I've done it. And I think uh, Cheryl and Vivian will share my information at the end. I have a couple of templates that I've, I've developed and I, I'm, I'm willing to share. 
Uh, but those, those types of documents I've, I've learned from someone else in the past, uh, that was a really good tip and, I, and I've used it many times and, and they always seem to work. Uh, it's just a really good example of how you can bring that something else that a lot of employers talk about. You know, if, if there are two people with the exact same experience, same education, how they differentiate? Well, that's how they differentiate by someone who just goes a step forward, right? And it, it would take you a day doing it. And by the time you're actually finishing drafting this document, mm-hmm. you'll be so much more knowledgeable about the company and about the market because you're, you're, it's like studying for an exam, except that you're actually generating something tangible that, uh, and professionally looking, of course, make sure there are no spelling errors in it uh, to, to the employer at the end of an interview. Excellent, thank you. Um, Yasmin's wondering, what made you choose to pursue a master's degree? Um, good question. Um, I've always, I think in, in today's world, uh, you, you have to always seek for the education. So for me, that was just a, a, a master's degree. Just I knew that at that time in my career, if I, wanted, if I looked at my managers and my directors at that time, they all had one thing in common. They all spoke a second language which I tick that box, but they all, they had a graduate degree. And I knew that in order to move forward, especially in my field of international education and contracts, when we are constantly being assessed on a, on a point scale, when we're bidding for projects with the World Bank or, or, or Global Affairs Canada, you're always being assessed on a scale. And a master's degree, a PhD, always gains more points. You're always getting more points. So for me, that was one motivation. The second motivation was when I looked up to where I wanted to be, they had, they all had master's degree. Mm-hmm. They, now, I think the real question is why I chose the MGB. And I think that was, a, a, again, a very straightforward process for me because it was the master's degree that was just, it provided the, the, the larger amount of skills that I would be able to take, to take back after I finished. So my investment just provided me with much more return. Um, a lot of other master's degree that were a year long were, just didn't have the, the, the amount of, of experience that the MGV would provide in terms of you're actually going from country to country. Uh, just the breadth of experience that you would gain from, from the MGV just seemed to be a much better value for my investment than other one year uh, MBA or, or master's programs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I think you've touched on the last question we have here, which is how did the MGB prepare you for your global career? Uh, yeah. So, the MGB program has allowed me to not only learn a new language, you know, and, and really I, I was able to, to get my Spanish from a basic level to an advanced level. So that was one. And I understand not everyone will be able to do that. I already had some, some Spanish speaking skills before. But what the MGB did, it allowed me to connect with colleagues from all over the world. Um, it allowed me to build a network of colleagues spread from Australia all the way to Peru. It allowed me to understand different business contexts within the classroom, you know, in, in discussions would have, would talk about how things were done in Peru and how things were done in Germany and how things were done in the Netherlands. So I bring that into my workplace all the time. So it, it, it gave me, it gave me a really strong foundation to, uh, to study, to, 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 you know, to succeed in the workplace. Something else that I also seem to talk about a lot in other engagements and I, and that's the plug for you, Vic, but, and, I, you know, I get to talk to people and and work with people all across Canada and across North America, in Africa and South America. And you, Vic, has an impeccable reputation. Mm -hmm. Um, And that I cannot stress it enough is that if you are going for a master's degree, make sure you go for a school that has a strong reputation because that would just open a lot of doors. Um, It will open conversations. I think your degree just becomes so much more valuable if you actually come from a school that strong that holds a strong reputation overseas. UVic has done that for me. I think UVic has uh, maintained very strong reputation over you know since I've graduated. Uh, I every time I talk to someone even in Ontario, Nova Scotia, I say I'm a UVic grad. Um, you know that that's usually not usually all the time. It's it's always well received as a school with with that's very high regarded not only in Canada but um, in the world as well. It's always always high ranked. Um, so for me, that, that has allowed me to really uh, see the clear return on my not so cheap investment into, <laughs> into my master's degree. Because, you know, it, it is what it is. The costs are, you know, anyone can, can see what those are. But 
Um, I have no doubt saying that I have recovered um, more than what I've invested in into my master's degree at this point in my career. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, switching gears, we have one last question, and it's a, it's a good question, so I'm hoping we can, we can fit this into. Um, when living or studying in a different country or community, we often encounter differences in thinking, which are not only caused by differences in language that, that um, uh, might be caused by something sort of deeper in terms of values differences or cultural differences, and it can make us often doubt our own ideas. So in your global career, how do you find opportunities in a different community without losing yourself? Hmm. Let me read that again. When living and studying different country. Um, yeah, you know, I think every time, and, and I see, I do this a lot because I'm always working with people from different countries is that, and even myself now being Canadian is that every time I encounter a, some sort of disagreement between myself and a colleague or myself and, and a client or a project partner, I always try to put myself in their shoes, but only in their shoes as a, as a partner, as another person, but also culturally. So try to understand why they've made that comment based on their cultural background. And there are a lot of good tools you can use, right? There are, of course, like culture, you, you may have, let's say if you're, you know, for example, Brazilians, you know, as being Brazilian, I, you know, I know this is, is the fact that not all Brazilians will be the same, but there's a pattern, right? So, you can always say, okay, if I disagree with that person and that person happens to be Brazilian, let me try to understand why that is. And, and if there is maybe a cultural aspect of it that I'm missing here, maybe I should be addressing it differently. Or maybe that person just doesn't agree with me, period. You know, that person could be from anywhere in the world. It doesn't really matter. So maybe it's maybe taking a step back. Every time you talk to someone that you actually disagree with, take a step back and see, okay, culturally, how are we different? Where do we sit in a spectrum? How far are we? And perhaps you may find the answer of uh, why you're disagreeing. But it doesn't always work because sometimes independently of the culture, you're just going to disagree with people. That's just the truth. It doesn't matter where you are. You know, that's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of how it is. Um, so I guess, how do you find opportunity? And then you, you, you ask, how do you find opportunities in a different community without losing yourself? Um, and I think that's it. I think it's, it's this idea of understanding where the other side is coming from. Um, and I remember when I was, when I was in Peru and I was looking for, for this contract so I, I could finish my, my master's degree and I could continue to work there after I graduated is um, I was working in a complete different culture that I, I've never been in and I never engaged in. I, I never read much about. So finding the right opportunity really came after I did a lot of research about the workplace and, and, and the industry that I wanted to be in in that particular market. So maybe if you are, let's say from a different community, you're moving to Canada or you're moving to a different place, I would maybe spend a lot of time doing as much research as possible and staying as informed as possible in that particular market. So you're able to, you're not caught by surprise when you're asked a question or when you're, when you're given an opportunity that, um, that uh, you're not familiar with. Right. So I think, Maybe trying to put yourself in the other person's shoes and staying informed. I don't know if that answered the question, but um, yeah, that's that's a difficult one because you know culture is so complex and there are so many different theories. I think in the NGV program we've studied a few, but there are just so many different theories that try to explain how cultural different cultures interact. And I think if if any of my colleague, you know, I think I have some colleagues from my class that joined the call. I think they they can all agree that. You can't, you can't paint a culture with one brush. Within the Brazilian culture, you have so many subcultures and, and you have individual personalities that just, you know, I'm Brazilian, but sometimes I, I think I act like an Italian, for example, and there's sometimes I act like a Canadian. So yeah, it's, it's one piece, but it's not the one, it's not, it's one piece of a big puzzle, mm -hmm. uh, but an important piece of that puzzle. Excellent. Thank you so much, Felipe, and thank you for, for your openness to, uh, to allow students to follow up with you if they have questions. We'll, um, I think we'll try to put up your contact information so that students uh, can get in touch with you if they have any further questions. Um, and I would just like to take this time to thank you so much for, uh, for doing this webinar. It was, was great talking to you, and I really appreciate the time that you gave us. That you sure, yeah. I think, I think a, less, a less remark that I, that I would give to students, too, is, is regarding networking. You know, I think a lot of times 
there's this constant pressure for networking, network. And now you might be wondering, like, how am I going to ask someone for coffee when the coffee shop is closed? <laughs> you know, they, they, and, and the thing is, is that continue to network. And, I, and again, I think I've sent over 500 messages on LinkedIn to like when I was a student, I've mm-hmm. sent so many messages on LinkedIn to people that had a cool job that I wanted to, had gone for a similar path, had an interesting background. And I think out of 500, um, I, I, didn't, I, I think I still have a spreadsheet somewhere. Uh, but you know, I didn't get many responses, but the ones that I did were really good. So if you send 10, you may get one response. If you send five, you're probably gonna get none. The trick is, it's don't give up, you know, continue, continue to engage, continue to look for those opportunities. And if someone doesn't reply to you, it doesn't mean that they don't like you. It just means that they're busy. You know, people, especially now working from home, I think everyone has realized that when you have children at home, when you have a family to take care of, you have a house, things pile up and, and sometimes you just don't have the time. You, you, the, the wish is there to, to support that student, but just the time isn't there. So continue to engage, use the LinkedIn, use the tools that you have, uh, engage your faculty member. I, I've learned over the years that faculty members, and I'm putting you on the spot, Vivian, love to help students because you know it's how it's a way to give back you know and faculty members are extremely well connected they all come from industry most of them come from industry they they can always refer back to that experience that you were how you had in the classroom so they can they can guide you and, and they can put you in touch with, with some very interesting folks and and I've, I've got jobs out of this you know out of out of networking opportunities and it's 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 very important and, and don't stop now that the word has digitalized mm-hmm. use you know just continue just don't stop and if even if you do get a job that is not something that you were precisely looking for continue during that job continue to to network continue to look for opportunities uh, because people will respond to you and they will help you i think there are a lot of good people out there that are willing to help um, a fellow alumni from uvic or someone who is willing to help uh, a student who is just starting out so continue just just don't stop you know and keep track create a spreadsheet there's nothing worse than someone getting back to you and you're not remembering and speaking from my own experience and you're not remembering how you contacted them or where you're contacting them because there's been times where i would get a reply back two months later and i would have no idea when i spoke to that person and that doesn't look good <laughs> track it's very easy to maintain a record of who you reach out to but very very important so just continue just don't stop Excellent. Good advice. Thank you so much again. So we will make sure we get uh, for people who are interested in following up with Felipe. Uh, we have uh, we will get his contact information. Um, we will be uh, posting the video of the recording and we'll make sure that his contact information is included there. Cool. All right, everyone. Thanks again for your time. I'm sorry if I didn't answer all the all the questions, but uh, I hope I did. And I'm uh, yeah, I'm looking forward. If you if you do reach out, please do. We can schedule a call. And then chat, uh, you know, that'll be for fun. I'd love to meet you. It'd be great to meet you. Terrific. Thank you so much.